If God knows that we're going to sin, why does he still punish us? If God is so merciful, why is there a hellfire? Better still, why is there an eternal hellfire? Welcome to Double Take, a podcast by Yaqeen Institute where we explore ideas and questions in Islam that give us pause. I'm Mohammed Zaud and today on the show we're exploring the concept or the reconciliation between Allah's mercy and Allah's punishment. And with me is Sheikh Muhammad al-Shinnawi, author of the paper, The Infinitely Merciful and the Question of Hellfire. Sheikh Muhammad, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Hafidhak Allah. Jazakum alaikum for having me, akhi. Sheikh, thank you so much for joining us. Mashallah alaik, uh, you, you studied extensively English literature and you also studied uh, at Medina University the uh, hadith and the sciences of hadith. So you could have gone in a million different ways, uh, but you decided uh, to focus, at least with, with regards to today's episode, you, you, you decided to focus on the question of hellfire. What led you to focus on this topic when you could have gone in, in multiple directions? So, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa sallallahu wa rasulillah, we begin the name of Allah, we'll praise and glory be to him, and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his family and his companions, and all those who adhere to his guidance mm. until the last day. Um, a number of reasons, it was requested of me, but this was a, a near and dear topic to my heart, because I've gotten this a lot, that how can we reconcile the fact that God is the most merciful, and the most great, and then he would actually punish us or even care about whether or not we are uh, upright or evil or any of that. I remember one young man uh, struggling with his faith. He said to me in a coffee shop once that you actually want me to believe that the creator of the galaxies actually cares what tiny me is doing in a tiny corner of this tiny rock in the middle of the universe. Uh, and that question, of course, it, it is a very arbitrary objection, but it, it speaks a lot to a sentiment that we should validate, which is the concept of hellfire does cause apprehension. I mean, no one wants to feel punishable, and that is normal. And maybe that sentiment is overly accentuated in our times because, you know, modern ethics and psychology, they're obsessed with the el elimination of guilt. Um, and so I understand where the sentiment is coming from, and a lot of people struggle with this. But at the same time, a lot of people struggle with the very opposite as well, that they want to be sure that God is merciful and compassionate and does does actually care about us, right? Mm -hmm. I remember being in a university once and they asked me to speak on God's mercy and his infinite compassion. And when I did so, I received a uh, email days later about a sister that was struggling with her faith. And my wife and I, we went to meet with her and I asked her, you know, what do you believe at the moment? Do you believe that there's a God to begin with? She said, I'm not sure. And it kind of blew my mind how this should not have, you know, um, triggered you to hear so much about God's mercy to the point that she walked out of the lecture, actually. And that's why she reached out to me. She said, I wasn't able to finish the lecture. But at the same time, if God is imaginary, if he's a fantasy, if he's a social construct, mm. then why would you be so moved about the mention of his mercy? And that's it. Like deep down inside, we want to know that God is there for us uh, on this distant planet us tiny creatures, when we're subjected to distress, when we're subjected to evil, when we're, uh, you know, subjected to uh, wrongdoing. But at the same time, you want to say, I think it's beneath God, or I hope that it's beneath God. He'll just overlook it when I'm the oppressor, I'm the one doing the wrongdoing. And so to reconcile these concepts is very healthy and really uh, an opportunity to show how only revelation can do it. And so to capture how revelation captured the balance between Allah Azzawajal's mercy and the possibility of punishment, this paper was an opportunity for that. No, I'm, I'm honestly very grateful that you've covered the topic and extensively as well, because a question in my mind, um, like we're going to go through, you know, why it was created and, and you know, the different uh, aspects of, of that. But the one thing that I need to ask right off the bat is why Allah even created hellfire? Like I know that, you know, when we pray five times a day, we always talk about or always hear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. You know, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. We always hear the, the concept of mercy and that's kind of, you know, the default uh, understanding that we have of Allah. But at the same time, we're taught about his punishment. Um, and, uh, and not just that, Allah spends so much 
time in the Quran describing that punishment. You know, in, in hellfire is not really kind of just mentioned and then mentioned in passing. It's very descriptive. It's very graphic. You know, there are moments in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they ask for water and they get oil instead. Or their skin is is replaced so they can so it can be burnt again. Like it's it's really graphic. So my question to you right off the bat is why did Allah create hellfire? Sure. I mean, some people may say this is graphic and it causes me anxiety to even hear about this. This is also said. And we want to question the notion is, is all anxiety bad? Like this was partially intended. Of course, this becoming the dominant, uh, you know, hyper fixation of your understanding of God and becomes, you know, uh, equivalent with God himself, the Punisher. That's not even one of his names, right? That becomes the problem. But there is a degree of anxiety. There is a degree of, you know, apprehension, uh, insecurity that could bring out of you the best version of yourself. And that is of the reasons why God created the hellfire and created it in such a way that he knows in his perfect wisdom will move us in that direction. Those of us that are willing to move, those of us prosperous enough to uh, accept, embrace the invitations and guidance and move in that direction. But, you know, there's something that needs to be said here, which is this is too graphic. This is too much. That is your, you know, logical assessment. It is illogical, actually, to assume that we would have no limitations in understanding God because he is the most wise, and which means we cannot possibly have, you know, the perfect uh, wisdom, the perfect understanding regarding God, right? We say in English, I'm not sure if they say in Australia, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Do you guys say that? Yeah, we say it. You sure you guys say it? It's all right. I mean, (laughs) sugar is not good for you anyway, but... (laughs) But yeah, so this saying means what? Like you, you can't enjoy something and then you know, uh, you know, keep it uh, in front of you forever. You you have to decide, right? So, so so why the apprehension? Like why do I need? Why do yeah. I need that anxiety in my life? So yeah, <laughs> l- anxious I, enough. <laughs> so a, a healthy dose, and and I think we should talk about how to determine it's a healthy dose. But what I meant with the. Uh, the example of it being illogical or this point is that is God the most wise? Is God the most just or are we? See, God created us. We have a sense for justice. We know what moral principles are like, you know, compassion, justice. Yes, we know these things. But moral judgments on the detailed level, we only know what God revealed to us. So you can't say I take my judgments, determinations of right and wrong from God and then come back and want to say, wait a minute, but how did God judge in this way? that there has to be a hellfire that is this much. And so why is it? It is extremely beneficial for there to be a hellfire uh, and extremely uh, equitable for there to be a hellfire. Beneficial because, I mean, look at the fruits. The people that say this is too much, well, you know, I'm not the one and I'm not even going to quote a Muslim that says Muslims are the most religiously committed people in the world. Uh, You know, uh, the the readers of this Quran are... Islam, their religion has such a command on them that people from other faiths notice it. I remember John Paul II, the, you know, the previous Pope, you know, he, he was once like lamenting to, to Christians or, or Catholics. He said to them that whenever I see our magnificent cathedrals and the beautiful architecture, and I think about how vacant they are all the time, I wish, you know, people from our faith would take a lesson from the Muslims who Wherever they are, they stop on a dime five times a day and they pray to their Lord, right? And so the fruit is actually there. And so someone who's offering a a different framework uh, needs to show us its fruits uh, on the ground. And so ultimately, there has to be a hellfire and it has to, we have to be told about it and told about it in the perfect way, which is the way the Quran said it. And that doesn't mean that this hellfire will ever outdo or win over on God's mercy. No. But at the same time, God's mercy does not necessitate that there not be justice. The same way we say in the paper that God's mercy is unlimited, we say that he is also not limited by his mercy from exacting justice. Okay, Sheikh, I I get it. Like that, it's about deterrence. You know, you have a carrot and a stick. And, um, you know, in this life, there are people who do absolutely awful things, um, whether they're, they're bombing something or... You know, there's a serial rapist or a serial killer or there's major kind of uh, atrocities that happen in this life. And the concept of hellfire is there as a deterrence for justice. I get that. 
but Allah being the most merciful, um, isn't there other ways for him to be just? Like, does he have to burn us? Yeah, so this is assuming that, you know, uh, people are going to be burned the moment they commit a sin. Uh, there are tons of stations for a person to be forgiven. So when we say God's justice, God's justice, God's justice, and we even focus too much on that, you're assuming that God will be just with you. No, God will always be at least just with you. But you know, great scholars mm -hmm. like Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he speaks about 11 stations of forgiveness that God sets up before a person is sentenced to the hellfire. Uh, you know, uh, he speaks about the fact that there are eight doors to par uh, paradise uh, and only seven gates to the hellfire. He speaks about how God many times sets up for you along your way, uh, you know, mechanisms and opportunities, not just to be deterred, but even when you're not deterred to reform that are involuntary. So it's not even like you're seeking God's forgiveness or you do a good deed that outweighs your bad deeds, but he'll send, you know, uh, a difficulty your way. Every prick of every thorn is yet another opportunity to, you know, put a dent in that pile of wrongdoing that could subject us to being burned at the very end of the road. Okay. Um, thank you. I mean, you're, you're helping me kind of come to terms with it. Um, and uh, I, uh, I get it. It's, it's there for justice. Um, my question to you then, and uh, this for me is a really challenging one um, because I get the question often. Uh, it's the concept of the infinite hellfire or the eternal hellfire, um, which means basically if I'm on this earth, for 70 years and let's just say I was sinning for 70 years and doing the same sin over and over again for 70 years mm -hmm. why then am I in hellfire for eternity right so this is also another common concern that is brought up uh, regarding punishment in the hellfire how do we say that God is just but at the same time there's an infinite punishment for a finite you know set of crimes which is a lifetime of crimes so let's build from the ground up Number one, no sin and no lifetime of sins will ever mean lifetime in the hellfire. That's not Islam, not Quran, not true. It is only shirk, which is the mother of all sins. Shirk mm -hmm. means to set up rivals to God. And ultimately, we would need another episode to speak about why shirk, why rejection of God, uh, setting up equals to God is the greatest sin. What is so, mm -hmm. you know dastardly about you know uh the the rights of the creator being violated the creator at the end of the day in a word is worthier and greater than all of the creation combined so violating him mm -hmm. equal a greater violation so that's number one we're only talking about shirk associating partners setting up rivals contenders with god that's number one the only sin a lifetime of sins that don't include that we're not talking about that Number sure. two, those who actually commit this mother of all sins, this shirk, if they did not receive the message of Islam, then they are not guilty for the greatest crimes. They get dismissed mm -hmm. as well because they didn't get a fair chance at discovering God and submitting sure. to him and uh, aligning with the truth. And then those who did commit it and receive the message and, you know, live their entire lives upon shirk, but they repented from it then they also are not included in the category, right? And so we're sure. talking about a very specific class of people. These are the people who committed shirk and received the message of Islam and continued to rebel against God after discovering his message and mm -hmm. died upon that. Those people might, and I use the word might deliberately, sure, enter okay. the hellfire forever. Why do I say might? Because the scholars of Islam all agree all of Sunni scholars agree that, you know, the believer will enter paradise forever and the disbeliever who is guilty of his disbelief and dies upon that will not ever enter paradise. But they disagree on whether he will be in the hellfire forever. Some of them, this is reported about even some of the Sahaba, like Abdullah al-Mas'ud and, you know, uh, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, some attributed to Umar, the position of Umar ibn Khattab himself. May Allah be pleased with them all. This is like the opinion most famously championed by Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, they believe mm -hmm. that these people will spend a very long time in the fire, that very specific class of people, but then they and the fire will cease to exist at some point. They will vanish. Okay? So people that cannot grasp this issue, 
you know, we tell them it is not like you're rejecting Islam. You're rejecting the mainstream understanding about this very specific point within Islam. But let me also defend the mainstream position because let's assume the mainstream position is right. The mainstream Would, position being um, that there is an eternal Healthy. That yes, that very specific class of For people that specific sin. would spend okay. eternity uh, in the hellfire. Would that be unjust? First of all, God would never be unjust. We've already covered that. We cannot one up God on His justice or His yeah. wisdom or His. Un but also, can this be rationalized now? Yes, the majority would argue that it can be rationalized. How? Because you are not being punished for your lifetime of shirk or you dying mm -hmm. upon shirk. You are being punished based on God's knowledge that you would have continued doing this forever. You see, God did not need to give us this life of ours to judge us. His foreknowledge is certainly sufficient and perfect. He gave us this life so that we would recognize at the end of it that we, he has not been unjust with us. But we are told in the Quran that when these people are standing over the fire, may Allah protect us and you from ever drawing near to the fire, when they're standing over it, they will say, Ya laytana nurad, we wish we can go back, meaning to this lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. And Allah says, if they were to go back, they would still be disbelievers. They'd go back to being disbelievers the like they were the first time, like they did the first time around. And so that is what they are being punished eternally for, according to that interpretation. So there's nothing unfair about it. You did not stop being a rejecter of God forever on your own accord. So you don't get credit for it you were interrupted from this by death. It is similar to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know when he said, when two Muslims come at each other, and this is not self-defense, right? This is actively, deliberately mm. trying to kill each other. Fighting, yeah. Without justification, right? Not in the pursuit of justice. One of them is not a police officer. <laughs> no, two Muslims come at each other with their swords. He said the killer and the killed are both in the fire. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we get it why the killer would be in the fire. But why would someone who's killed go to the fire? He said because he was keen on killing his brother. You see, the fact that he lost the fight or was one step too slow is not something he gets credit for. And therefore, their punishment would be equal. That is the idea of how an infinite uh, punishment, were that the case, to still be fair, if you only got a chance to act out a finite number of crimes or the mother of all crimes, should we say. So if I'm to summarize, because there's a lot to take up, sorry, like, to take in. No, no, I, I, I'm, I appreciate it, you know, and it's a very kind of intricate uh, topic. So, you know, Hellfire was created for, for justice, and I think um, we acknowledge that. Um, and the, the concept of it being a, an eternal Hellfire uh, is debatable amongst the scholars. Um, there is a portion of scholars or some Sahabi who say, that there is no eternal hellfire, it actually ceases to exist after a period of time. But the majority of scholars say um, that there is an eternal hellfire, but there's only one group of people that fall into that category. Um, but the you know the the bulk of people are going to paradise through hellfire, if, if I understand correctly. Um, uh, you go as far as saying that hellfire plays a therapeutic role. Uh, now, I have never come across this concept before of hellfire being therapeutic. It's probably the last thing that I think about when I think of kind of hell uh, and, and, and the atrocities that happen in hell. Um, what's this concept of a therapeutic hellfire? Yeah, so we discussed some of this in the paper, but it is beyond the scope of even that paper. There is so much... Uh, that can be said on the therapeutic uh, offerings uh, of the existence of the hellfire, how what that serves. Yeah. So even in this world, for example, a person is, is uh, spiritually rehabilitated by the concept of the hellfire. What does that mean? The same way that, you know, prosperity and luxury and extravagance can delude a person into doubting things, right? Like doubting the reality mm -hmm. of this world, the temporal nature mm -hmm. of this world doubting God, all that, right? The same way luxury can delude a person into doubting. Likewise, uh, fear can drive a person to faith because the mm. possibility of it being true is going to make me want to confirm because the stakes are high. That is our human nature. God who created our psyche knows how we function. And so that is part of mm. uh, the reason why there's a fire and the therapeutic function spiritually of that. That's in this world. 
And then also take an example from the next world, like in the hereafter. There are people that would enter the hellfire to be purified from their crimes. And so mm. remedying the souls that have, you know, corrupted themselves, a person can say, can God, you know, remedy them without punishing them? Yes, but he deemed that part of the just requital is that there may be an element of, uh, of pain involved. There may be an, uh, an element of sentencing. It is actually the pain. It is actually the temporary suffering mm. that purifies them uh, as dictated by his perfect justice, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also therapeutic for uh, those that deserve to uh, be avenged. You know, I remember one writer who did not believe in a God. She was stuck uh, post-World War uh, with a notion that she wrote about in her memoirs. She said, wait a minute, Hitler just died and that's it? Hitler just died and that's it? You know, likewise, mm. you know, many people who... Uh, you know, saw the brunt of an oppressor, they will never feel fully healed until they see justice with their own two eyes. That's actually why in the Quran, Allah speaks about his favor on the Israelites and he says, And one of the things hmm. we did for you, we blessed you with allowing you to see our drowning of the Pharaoh while you were looking on from the, from the shores, right? And so in the hellfire, there will be people that will be healed by seeing those who massacred their children, killed okay. their loved ones, imprisoned their fathers their, and their sons, and so on and so forth. They will be healed by this. Okay, so it's therapeutic in two ways. It's therapeutic in the sense that um, those who are on the receiving end of an injustice or an oppression, knowing that the oppressor is being punished is therapeutic in itself, um, but also uh hellfire being therapeutic in the sense that it's a cleanse before we get into paradise and that's two ways in in the next world on top of the spiritual rehabilitation that happens in this world being driven to faith by fear okay yes. okay so like clearly you know i this, this is the first time i i learn about concepts like this and you talk in your paper about um, the way Allah's mercy is explained to us and the way Allah's punishment is explained to us as we're growing up, you know, in our pedagogy. Uh, how would you teach Allah's mercy and Allah's punish punishment if I was sitting there after one of your lectures and I had all those doubts? What would be your methodology? What's the right way to kind of explain this whole concept to a younger me, for example? Yeah, this is really about changing a person's frame of reference. You know, to the credit of Australians, uh, when I visited Melbourne, uh, it, there was a lot of political turmoil, uh, Muslim related, a lot of raids were happening first time in Australian history. And, mm. you know, I, I was met at the conference by a Muslim brother who did his PhD, his thesis on Islamophobia, right? The manufacturing of fear, right? The fear mongering that is very systematic sure. towards and about Muslims for policies and to the end of it, right? So. He apparently has to like sit on, on a lot of panels and a lot of news briefings and he's invited by a lot of news anchors and channels to speak about this whenever like a bad Muslim is in the news. So he said to me something so profound backstage and I took it with me over the years. He said to me, Sheikh, you have no idea how hard it is to begin a conversation from a beheading, right? Because, you know, uh, some, you know, radicalized being Muslim that, that took being things the topic into his own to, hands. To, to kick off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so he beheaded someone or something, right? He says that, you know, uh, that shocking image, that visualization that's been, of course, mm. disproportionately focused on in the news and so on and so forth. He says when that's on everybody's mind, it, act, it doesn't matter much that I'm the standing expert that knows all the statistics about how peaceful Muslims are compared to other communities and groups and so on. And so, none of this matters. Because the frame of reference, the you know, the premise from which the conversation launched was a beheading. So it's just like it falls on deaf ears. So that's what you want to do here as well. People's frame of reference needs to change by the way we speak about this as well. Like it's not just, you know, the secular age and the anti-religious sentiments that, you know, skew people and create that imbalance of fear more than hope. It's, you know, it's bad preaching also. When me and you grew up and perhaps heard so much about Allah as, you know, an imposer of injunctions, haram, halal, hellfire. 100%. We were taught 100%. to fear Allah so much more than we were taught to love Allah. 
that's a big problem because how did Allah introduce himself in the Quran? Like you say, you read all the time in Al-Fatiha, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, right? Most merciful granter of mercy. Yeah, we read that. And before we read Maliki Yawm deen right? The intimidating owner of the day of judgment verse. Because Allah wants us to see him that way. That he is the most merciful first and then owner of the day of judgment also. And this is permeates the Quranic narrative, by the way. You know, Allah says, for example, tell my servants that I am the most forgiving and I am the most mm. merciful and my punishment. He doesn't say I am. I'm the most merciful. I'm the most forgiving. And my punishment is severe punishment. That's as if to say, this is who I am. And if I happen to punish, it's bad. Right? It's a very different, mm. it's nuanced, but it's a very different description. Every surah in the Quran begins with Allah's mercy. It doesn't begin by any other attributes of God. And so centering that is extremely important. And that does require, like you said, some unlearning and some relearning. And part of this is not just reading deeply the Quran. Part of this also, it requires us to focus on and realize the importance of self-awareness. Like, am mm -hmm. I imbalanced? What needs more nourishment? Because, you know, they say that for your relationship with God to take flight, the early Muslims would say it is like, you know, the metaphor of a bird. The head of the bird is the love of God, because that's what your perspective comes from your head, right? And also your mm -hmm. life, because if you lose your head, you lose your life. So the head of the bird, the most dominant quality we, a believer should be having towards God is love. And then and the I two wings the of the bird. to learn. Yeah, you got to learn how to love God. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And then there are the wings. The wings are fear and hope. Fear and hope. You have to figure out, am I too afraid? Am I not, you know, uh, hopeful enough? And then if I am hope too hopeful, you know, is there not enough fear? So you got to create that balance so that your flying is actually linear. Survival and then linear progression. Sheikh, as you're talking about the concept of hellfire and, and punishment and um, its therapeutic nature, <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking honestly, like of the verse, uh, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, what does He want with your punishment? Like, why, why would He even want to punish you? That's not what He wants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But growing up on the minbar, you know, in, in Islamic circles, it's always the stick, you know, it's always kind of Allah do this or you will get punished, you know, for example. If we grew up in that environment and, you know, our fear of Allah is is warranted because that's what we're hearing and that's our default position. Um, how do we find that balance? You know, how do we grow up now and reteach ourselves that balance between Allah's mercy and Allah's, you know, justice and punishment? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... Some of our scholars, they said that uh, we should understand the Quran to be a written universe and, you know, the counterpart, the universe is like an observable Quran, meaning they go hand in hand uh, towards understanding reality and faith. So if we said the Quran is very clear on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy being dominant and infinite and mm -hmm. unimaginable, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his compassion being greater for us. Uh, than we ever realize and greater than you know our mother's mercy for us as the Prophet ﷺ said if that is the case we also are able to see that in the universe and that is why Allah told us in the Quran ila go and look at the signs of the mercy of Allah everywhere you know so with that lens you need to approach the world be mindful be looking for Allah's mercy while certain from his book that it's there so that is a, a cognitive process that is part of spiritual growth, spiritual training, spiritual development to see with your insight, uh, you know, what your eyes are detecting, what you're detecting mm. with your eyesight. That's an important part of it. And then also you need to self-evaluate that what should I be focusing on? How do you know that you're not focused enough on the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal? Well, you quit doing good deeds. You see, because an extreme in... Uh, Hope is like an extreme in fear. If you have too much hope, you think everything's under control and I'm fine. Yeah, sure. you, you're not driven, right? Fueled to do good deeds because you feel like you don't need to. And likewise, too much fear, you're going to say, I'm done, I'm doomed, there's no point, and so I'm not going to do. And so your, I don't want to say sweet spot, but you got to find wh where you are most productive, where you are most accelerating on that straight path. 
And so long as there are deeds to be done, you want to figure out the balance that'll drive you forward, that'll carry you. And then when the deeds are over, you want to resign back to Allah's mercy. You know, like when you couldn't do the deed and you failed. And that's not the end of the world. That's why, you know, Ibn Atha, rahimahullah, he said that of the signs that you're depending too much on your deeds is that you quit or you lose hope when you fail, when you commit a bad deed. It's like, whoa, why are you mm. quitting? It was never about your deeds to begin with. Like ultimately it's about Allah's mercy and that's the way we want it, right? And likewise, when your life is at, at its end, uh, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anh, said that we heard him say, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, three days before he died, let no one of you die except while assuming the very best of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is your Lord who you're going to meet, your maker who took care of you and you're going back to him now. And since there's no more deeds to be done, you're at the end of your life, then you lean on your greatest deed, which is hinging on his mercy. So it is a process. It is a lifelong process. Islam is not an event. Islam is a journey. And so give yourself time. Don't too be too hard on yourself. Look and let the measuring stick, the metric be actions for what is a healthy dose for me and then act accordingly because it really does vary and it does need to be customized. You know, Ibn al-Qayyim, and I, I won't take long saying this, he speaks about the difference of opinion scholars had regarding your sins. Should I remember them or mm. should I forget them? He said, and the correct opinion is that they, these are all right for different contexts. That if remembering my sin will help me from getting arrogant, like what do you get all conceited and arrogant yeah. about? You've only been in the masjid for a year, you've been clubbing for five years, then remember your sin. And if remembering your sin will, uh, you know, slow you down, and be a tool that shaitan leverages on you that you think you're going to be a good person now, you think you'll ever be able to turn a new leaf, then forget your sin and, you know, steamroll ahead. And so it, it is a lifelong journey, Allah's book, Allah's universe, find the balance, balance is determined by, you know, your productivity and your actions and be self-aware, understand yourself, you are your own best doctor, inshallah. Sheikh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up very shortly, but I have one last question. Um, we spent, alhamdulillah, the last half an hour or so explaining the concept. And honestly, like, I, I'm content. I, I'm happy with the, the answer. But how would I explain this to a nine-year-old? So if, if that nine-year-old asks you, Sheikh, why does hellfire exist? Why does Allah want to burn me? <laughs> or words to that effect. What's your answer to that nine-year-old kid in 30 seconds? So I, I would make sure that this child has the proper frame of reference for sure. Like if this is my child, I know that this question will require a very simple answer because she sees Allah has that. Uh, but just in general, a generic answer, you know, is that, you know, we know that Allah is the most merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is more merciful than all of our moms and all of our dads combined. He's the one that made them merciful, you know, made their hugs so warm made their heart so selfless. He did that. He's the owner of all of that. And so knowing this, then you need to just rest assured that everyone is going to enter paradise, except those who insist not to, except those who refuse. Because I do believe, even for a child, the best answer is the answer of the Prophet ﷺ, right? And he did tell us, كُلُّ أُمَّةِ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَبَى Every single person in my ummah, meaning those mm. I was sent to, will enter paradise, except those who refuse. They said, who would refuse, O Messenger of God? He said, those who follow me enter paradise. And those who, uh, you know, renegade, those who refuse, those who rebel, then they have refused paradise. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Muhammad. And thank you so much for the paper and for your work on this concept of hellfire and Allah's mercy. Jazakallah oh, yeah. khair. And inshallah, I look forward to the next few episodes regarding other topics, inshallah, with you. Inshallah.